This morning I'm actually addressing you in my capacity as uh, the newly appointed chairman of the Public-Private Partnership Agency, as I'm told it's going to be called, and hopefully quite temporarily its acting CEO. I've been less than two days in my position as there has been uh, somewhat of a transitional bottleneck, which I don't want to go into details on. Uh, so I'm not going to make any earth-shattering revelations, but try and build a perspective amongst you, the captains of the private sector, on possibly some initiatives I will take in executing reforms and building a PPP institution, uh, which is really the theme of this session. Now, PPPs, what does it entail and what is it going to cover? The Chamber of Commerce has in fact defined PPPs as new projects in which the private sector has a long-term controlling interest in the project, with the government having the role of some part of ownership, financial support or regulation, or the provision of land on lease, and it is usually governed by a specialized agreement. What a PPP is not, according to the Ceylon Chamber, is construction contracts and the sale or lease of land. Now, I'd like to slightly finesse that definition because, you know, when I met the Prime Minister yesterday, I asked, he, was, he specifically asked me, make your own definition and pretty much chart a, a, a course that would uh, adapt the definition to today's realities. And my definition is uh, pretty much new investments or capital formation in PPP type, whether it's infrastructure or what have you, and the transfer of ownership or lease of dead or unproductive government assets on a new business model. And both these aspects would be governed by a complex, what we call concession agreement, which is that special PPP agreement that uh, I spoke about earlier. So therefore, by definition, privatization is not part of my mandate. So just to give you an example of what my mandate might include would be obviously power projects, toll roads, new uh, container terminal. These are examples of new capital formation in, in, in PPP projects. The example, second example of dead assets of the government to be transferred to the private sector on a new business model, I can cite a project that I was involved with, which was SAGT, uh, which was Queen Elizabeth Key, hardly producing any economic return to the country, which is now producing significant returns as a PPP operated by John Keyes and P&O. Hambantota is certainly a PPP. It's a debt asset transferred under a new business model. And possibly, if you look at maybe another example is the Hyatt Hotel, which I believe is a debt asset at the moment. Honorable Kabir Hashim is not here today. Uh, but certainly Hilton is not. Hilton will be a privatization because it's an operating asset. Just to place PPPs in its context, um, Mano and I were colleagues when we were much younger in public service where he was the director general of the privatization commission which was called PERC, Public Enterprises Reform Commission on which I was ex officio on the board as the ch then chairman of the BOI. Uh, and to complement the B board of investment and PERC, there was another institution called the Public uh, Private Sector Infrastructure Development Company, PSIDC, where donor, donor funding was given to PSIDC to create a long-term financing instrument to support privatizations and PPP projects. So these three agencies had common boards, were run by private sector professionals, and worked hand in glove. And that is why we saw, during the period 1996 to 2001, a plethora of privatizations and PPP projects being implemented, including the biggest ever privatization at the time, which was Sri Lanka Telecom, and the biggest ever PPP, and the first ever in the port sector in South Asia, SAGT. In terms of, I mean, these are lessons learned, which I hopefully can apply in, in my second inning, so to speak. Um, another aspect that succeeded in, in, in PPPs, uh, originally the PPP unit of the government in 94, 95 was within the Ministry of Finance. And when I was invited to set it up under the Board of Investment, I managed somehow uh, to obtain blanket approval to hire staff on market rates. So the first de Deputy Director General of the PPP unit, which was called the Bureau of Infrastructure Investment, was paid uh, 
salary of 100,000 rupees then, which I did a quick inflation adjusted calculation to today, that works out to about 750,000 rupees today, even though it is still below market. Second thing that worked for me was USAID, the US government agency allocated a $2 million grant fund, grant funding line, so that the BII was able to hire top international consultants and professionals to support the line ministry concern. And thirdly, what succeeded was that um, the Board of Investment Board was staffed, board, board of Investment Board comprised the right sort of people. Three top secretaries, including the Secretary of Finance, who acted as a buffer and, and, a, and, and, and a policy making body. One aspect I have to mention about the staff, when the staff were recruited, they were recruited on contract basis. So they left their jobs, joined the public sector, and I was able to hire and fire them which we cannot do in the private sector. But they still came. One in five, I would reckon, I did have to terminate. So it was a performance-based culture was created. But some of the people I fired, they're still my friends, they, they gained from the experience and moved on to bigger and better things. So with these ingredients, what did we achieve? During a time of war, when we had what I call country risk, a war risk, insurance premiums, etc. We closed, financially closed, $800 million worth of PPP projects. If you were to inflation adjust it to today, it's almost $2 billion. A case study was SAGT, where it was to be funded with Japanese funding as a public investment project. When the private investment proposal landed on our table, we found that on a cost per TEU basis, the public investment project was two and a half times that was that of the private investment project. So it was a case study. We then went on to implement Sri Lanka's first ever power project on a PPP basis and completely financially closed 400 megawatts of thermal power during the time. The first ever mini hydro was structured by this small team of people who were in their 20s and 30s at the time. Lanka Bell and Suntel were again quasi PPPs because they were governed by certain regulatory and and, and a special type of BOI agreement, and it created competition within the fixed telephony system. IT, the ICT sector received special attention of the PPP unit, and there were several things that were done, amongst which one was the declaration of Malabe as the IT zone, and a special land-based PPP type structure for Millennium Information Technology to build their campus in Malabe. And we can call it a PPP, but technically it's not, the creation of SLIIT, today Sri Lanka's largest IT and engineering university, to which the Board of Investment gave its first seed capital because no government agency nor treasury wanted to fund it. So I went to my board, thankfully, as I mentioned, I had a very dynamic board, and we gave them 30 million rupees to start in rented premises as a grant. If that were to be valued today as a business, even though SLIIT runs as a not-for-profit, it would be worth 6 billion rupees because today SLIT employs 8,500 people and banks about 400 million rupees in cash, not for profit. So, not a simple PPP structure. Virtusa wanted to set up in the country. I signed the BOI agreement somewhere in 97. They said we need high bandwidth. So I got treasury funding, laid a fiber optic cable entirely through the WTC and that is where Virtusa started their business. So the initial IT industry Export-oriented IT industry started at the WTC in 1996. I still remember IT exports were only three million dollars. If there is one star in our economy over the last 20 years which has grown at roughly 20% compound annual, it's the IT industry, and that is because from the privatization of telecom, from the creation of SLIT, from the creation of the right taxation environment, including the elimination of duties from laptops, from computers, telecoms, etc. That is what created the foundation. So it's now up to me to figure out what's the next wave of ICT. Uh, Sri Lanka's largest ever middle income housing projects were created by the BII. And there again, there were two large parcels of land, Millennium City, Aturugiriya, and Nivasipur Ekala. The RFP, the request for proposal document, here's where the creativity comes in. The RFP was issued to commercial banks, not to developers. Why? Because we told the commercial banks, in 1996 or 97, you pick the developer that you want to finance, but we are giving you the RFPs because we want you to create a mortgage industry. 
the mortgage industry was a fraction of what it was today. I believe that these two projects where there are now probably 3,000 houses being built had a role to play in, in, in developing the mortgage industry in our country. So let me come to the present in my last five minutes or six minutes. Um, so what I intend on doing is creating a brain trust of professionals to do PPP projects to meet the current imperatives of the country and, uh, at the moment. And that brain trust would include, hopefully, investment bankers, economic researchers, top negotiators. When I handpicked the head of the BII in 1996, I, unfortunately he's not here today, but I'd like to mention him by name because he did a fantastic job, Mr. Manon Anakar. I picked him because of his Trump-like negotiating skills, but now Trump is proving to be a lousy negotiator. But nevertheless, he was the best negotiator and that I have ever worked with, apart from his financial brain. So it is crucial that we negotiate the right type of deal for the country. So what I hope to do is create this multi-skill team working with the line ministry plus external consultants with the PPP unit hopefully being the catalyst. So I am looking for a new CEO, but unfortunately I, cabinet has approved at least some months ago only 350,000 rupees for the CEO. So if any one of you have sufficient wealth to um, uh, you know, come and lend me your services, I'm, I'm quite open uh, because I am looking for someone with actual ability to close transactions and, and not really someone to warm his seat and earn 350,000 rupees and do whatever else. Um, the second thing I need, which I now am told I have, is funding. So the government has allocated 100 million rupees uh, to get this thing going. The World Bank is coming with, it, with an $800 million grant funding for a resident advisor and a resident company to advise on various aspects. A $25 million IBRD long-term loan to strengthen the framework to also fund some pilot PPP projects and to procure technical assistance. So the ingredients are largely in place. Um, so what I hope to do to succeed hopefully is to provide this value-added facilitation service to the line ministry to strategize, to structure, to negotiate, and the most important aspect, to close these transactions. Because without the ability to close transactions, I always used to say this as a former investment banker, the art of investment banking is in the art of closing a particular transaction. Um, so very quickly to conclude, um, there is some confusion whether the PPP is going to be a unit within the finance ministry or a national agency for public-private partnership. Yes, eventually I believe that we need to create institutional capacity. But I have some immediate priorities, and that is to appoint a board of directors, a board of advisors, which I believe will primarily comprise of uh, ministry secretaries within ministries where there's a pipeline of PPP projects. I want to prioritize, I want to look at the pipeline and prioritize the projects that I want to do, and it was spoken of earlier, some quick wins is absolutely crucial. I want to get the guidelines and the templates approved through the system, but I want to have, rather than producing, there is a draft 30-page guideline document produced by USAID that needs to undergo some revision, but I, I want to get a short term, within one month, a cabinet approval, I'm hoping, to, to, to at least get the basic guidelines out of the way, and then over the next three, three months or so, hopefully the guidelines through the national, in, in, get them implemented through the national procurement guidelines, and then eventually, hopefully, uh, there will be a law governing PPPs. I want to also work with the existing resources we have by forging linkages with the Board of Investment, Megapolis Ministry, etc. Work with external transaction advisors, some investment bankers here, you might get some work coming your way. A panel of legal advisors, both uh, overseas and locally, because there are some transactions which are extremely, extremely complex. In fact, SAGT and, and, and Port City and uh, CICT, all of them secured external legal advice, working very closely, obviously, with the Attorney General's department. I want to also create the research and anal analytical capability to cast a relatively wider net to capture PPP projects. And some of the sectors I've sort of planned to look at 10 sectors, though I don't want to spread myself too thin, so the priority would be the transport infrastructure, utilities, ports, tourism, construction covering affordable housing, healthcare, etc. IT, uh, it was spoken about e-procurement, I mean I will look at working closely with the ICTA to see what are the 
fast projects that we can fast track because if there's any way that we can function as an efficient government it is through ICT if I have the time the resources etc I'd like to look at PPPs in agribusiness the mining and mineral sector why is this sector being neglected for the last 20 years we have a phosphate mine that can in fact not only meet entirety of Sri Lanka's fertilizer needs but export hundreds of millions of dollars of fertilizer over the next 200 years or so. We are just staring at it and doing nothing. We have graphite, we have titanium, nothing has happened. So I'm hoping that I'll have the backing of the policymakers to start looking at the mineral sector, financial services, logistics. So in a nutshell, I'm hoping that PPPs would act as a catalyst of economic growth combined with some of the public investment projects that are being planned, such as the Central Expressway. In 1996, when the BII was set up, I set out to focus on five large projects that would actually generate confidence, as you said, Kanaka, earlier. And these five large projects were very much under implementation by 1999. And 1999, if you look at the statistics, Professor Hausman's statistics I looked at, and I'm happy to say this, I'm not trying to brag about it, but, but this is kudos to the team at the time, the highest net FDI, net FDI, which takes out loans and FDI computations by you know, invest, reinvesting retained earnings, the highest net, net FDI as a percentage of GDP since 1978 was recorded in 1999. And that year, 7.9% GDP growth. Sad to say that $200 million was the equity FDI in 1999, and I'm told that the equity FDI, this is the net figure, in 2016 was only $300 million. So there's a lot to be done. What is the project pipeline? One more minute. Uh, from what I know, uh, as I told you, I'm two days on the job. The elevated highway from the New Kalini Bridge to Aturugiriya, uh, the Asian Development Bank is a transaction advisor. There's an underground tunnel plan from, to extend the marine drive Thankfully, not impacting on golf face, it'll go underground and connect with the port city access and the elevated highway to uh, the airport. Uh, that's been structured as a PPP. Inland water-based inland water -based transport, um, inland air transport, LRC, some utility projects in water, waste to energy, ports, industrial zone. One final comment on solicited versus unsolicited proposals. During my entire five years, we did not entertain a single unsolicited proposal. So please, private sector, if you have an unsolicited proposal, just send me the concept. I'll figure out what to do with it. I know unsolicited proposals have a role to play, um, but they may, the government does have a policy of, at the moment, uh, implementing unsolicited proposals through the Swiss challenge method, which I have some concerns about. Um, finally, nevertheless, I'm, Quite happy to be re-invited again by the government 20 years after, or 21 I think, after I set up the BII. What I'm sad about, frankly, is that the BII is defunct. There is no institutional capacity, there is no single point of reference for investors to talk about PPP projects. They have to go from line ministry to line ministry. Having said that, uh, I will try and spend as much time as I possibly can. In final comment is that Sri Lanka has what it takes to do PPPs, complex PPPs. We have five, we have only five, but they are significant. There are five PPP, what I call PPPs that are over $200 million in investment that are already operating. Number one would be SAGT, then we have CICT. I believe the Tata construction project is also a PPP because that involves slum resettlement. We have Port City and the biggest, the mother of them all, the Hambantota. 1.1 billion dollars which will get signed up shortly. So I look forward to the challenge and I also look forward to working very closely with the chamber. I would very much value our wise counsel. Thank you very much.